Good morning. Uh, before I tell you to get in your Bibles, there's actually a couple things I want to talk to you about real quick, if that's okay. Um, one, I want to show, like, it's probably one of my favorite slides being shown right now. Uh, this is my friend Jermaine. He is, like, one of my favorite. Yeah, see, some of my people know this person. So he's been helping me in kids' ministry for, like, two years. He is great. He's one of my favorite leaders. I know I'm biased because my son loves him. And so, you know, as you guys know, my son has Down syndrome. And so, like, and he's also, he knows his dad's in charge. So, like, I see it. Like, he's like, I can do whatever I want. And Jermaine helps me a ton with that. Um, but I've noticed that if I put Jermaine with kindergartners, he'll go with kindergartners. If I put Jermaine with fourth graders, he'll go with fourth graders. Like, it's, he'll just follow him around. And so, and here's the thing. You might be like, well, yeah, well, Jermaine probably has this long history of helping kids ministry. No. This is his first time doing it. And why do I bring that up? Because I think there's more Jermaines and there's more Terry Ann's and there's more people like the leaders I see in here. And so if you are interested, if you're not helping anywhere, I'd love for you to scan. We'd love to have your help. Especially, I'm going to be honest with you, we're having a lot of more special needs families coming in, which is one of my dreams and hopes is I want, I want their kids to not be excluded, to be included. And so, and, and, and I, I'm thankful that God is trusting us with these families. And so, but we're just needing more help with it. So if you are not doing anything you want to come help and with either some babies or some older kids we'd love to have your help with that another thing that is happening is um i feel like catalyst is the best it's ever been right now like i'm i've been blown away the last couple weeks on how kids are engaging in worship how they're like they're not goofing off during the message that they're really uh conversating having conversations in uh their squads and i really think that happened because we took some of them to summer camp and exposed them to like impactful worship and impactful message and so we want to do that again we're going to take them the 28th through the 30th we have a lot of kids signed up but, and a lot of kids have p paid the minimum, but they can't pay the rest. And so I'm just asking, I, I don't want you to use your tithe to give this, but if God's asked you to go beyond your tithe, and it could be just $10, we would love to have that because we really believe it's going to continue to impact kids where we can take them somewhere and bring them back and then t bring with them what they took back there. So thank you for that little spiel right there. So open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. If you don't have a traditional Bible and, uh, and you'd like one, just raise your hand and our leaders will come bring you one that you can either borrow or can keep or you can go to the U version or the Bible app and all of the scriptures and everything will be there except for the picture I have. If you're watching us online or at one of the many services at the Brown County Correctional Facility, we love you. We're glad you're here. And, and, you know, maybe you could put the other thing on mute and just watch this real quick. And if the score isn't the way you like it, maybe just pause it real quick and then just kind of engage and mess it. I'm glad you guys are here. And, and we're not going to spoil anything. I know we're recording. I know. Here's what I can tell you. I'm glad I was here for that worship. Like, come on. Like, I don't care what the score is. I'm glad I was here to worship Jesus at that level. So, in 1977, CBS developed a TV show about a man named Dr. David Banner, a widow physician and a scientist who is presumed dead. And he travels across America under assumed names and finds himself in positions where he helps others in need despite his terrible secret. You see, following an accident that altered his cells of extreme anger and stress, he transforms into a huge, savage, incredibly strong, green-skinned humanoid who has been named the Hulk. In his travels, Banner earns money by working temporary jobs while searching for a way to either control or cure his condition. So in this series, there was a catchphrase. There was a catchphrase where David Banner would warn the people like, hey, like, don't get me mad. Like, hey, 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 leave me alone. And, I, and as a child, I love comic books. I still love comic books. I love superheroes. But I did not like the Hulk. And because he would say this catchphrase, and in fact, what would happen, this is what scared me. That, yes, that scared me. But when his eyes got to that, 
Like, that scared me to the point where I was a kid and I would, like, yell at the TV, like, no, 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 don't, don't, no, 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 no. Or I would just walk away. I'd be like, I'm done. And, and I remember, like, there would be commercials for, like, next week on the Hulk. I'm like, no, no more next week. Like, cancel the show. And, and there was this catchphrase he said that I didn't like. And that catchphrase is actually the title of my message, which is, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak your word and to speak your word in a way that maybe people need to hear and maybe need to hear in a new way. So, Lord, I pray that it wouldn't fall on deaf ears. Lord, that people wouldn't be distracted. They wouldn't be uh, uh, irritated. They wouldn't be angry. But, Lord, they would hear this word. They would be challenged by it, and they would walk away saying, I'm going to do things different. So, Lord, be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So, anger. The, dif- uh, the dictionary defines it as a strong passion or emotion of displeasure and usually antagonism, excited by a sense of injury or insult. So anger isn't just an emotion, but it's a cluster of emotions involving the body, the mind, and the will. And anger, I mean, it's all around us. In fact, 30% have said that a close friend or family member have trouble controlling their anger. of people have trouble controlling their own anger. 25% worry about how their anger makes them feel sometimes. 25% have ended a relationship or friendship because of that person's anger. 60% agree that people in general are just getting angrier. 45% of us regularly lose our temper at work, whereas 80% of drivers say they've been involved in road rage incidents, whereas 25% of drivers said they have committed that act of road rage. And 50% of us have overreacted to computer problems with anger. So, anger is all around us. But the question is, is anger wrong? And as I look through the Bible, I see that anger isn't wrong. It isn't evil, it's not sinful, it's not a part of our fallen nature, nor is it Satan at work in our lives. In fact, Dr. Gary Chapman said, anger is evidence that we are made in God's image. It demonstrates that we still have some concern for justice and righteousness in spite of our fallen estate. So it's, it's normal to be angry. I mean, we should be angry when there's injustices. Like, we should be angry that sex trafficking is still happening. That school shootings is still a normal thing. That bullying happens every single day. That people are being robbed and attacked. And in our world, we don't feel safe in it. We should be angry with unrighteousness. That sin, which the Bible says leads to death, is being ignored and normalized. That God, who has brought us freedom through Jesus, is being mocked and pushed out of people's lives because of incidences and failures. And God has expressed anger. In fact, 375 verses in the Old Testament talk about God's anger. So anger in itself isn't the issue. In fact, you could say not having anger could be a possible loss of moral concern. So if anger isn't the issue, then why is it destroying our homes? Why is it destroying our marriages, our relationships, our opportunities, our character? It's because of what we do with our anger which is the problem. And we see Paul talk about this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 27, which says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. So our anger, it just needs to be controlled, or it will lead to sin and opportunities for the devil to have a place in our lives. So how do we control our anger? Like, how do we get to a point where we don't let anger win and we're not easily controlled by anger? If you're taking notes, I think there are three things that will help us control our anger. Here's number one. When it comes to controlling our anger, one, you need to reveal your anger. Meaning you need to admit you're angry. Now, for some of us, that's easy. Because we have what's called explosive anger, where we just let it out. On people, places, and things. So it's, and so it's not really hiding. You just see it right there. But for some of us, we have what's called impulsive anger, where we kind of keep it in. And we, and we keep it to ourselves, and we'll say, I'm not angry. I'm just frustrated. I'm just irritated. I'm annoyed. I'm just disappointed. 
But the reality is we are angry. And again, the scripture doesn't say don't get angry, but it says don't sin when you get angry. So don't mask your anger. Reveal the anger so that you can identify why you're angry. Even That's for impulsive and explosive anger. You can say, oh, I'm angry. Well, why? Because we can't just say I'm angry because that person called me that name. Or that person said that joke, and they know I don't like that joke. It can't just be that. You can't just identify the action as why you're angry. But why has the action caused us so much anger? Like, why does a word take us over the edge? Why does a joke, a loss of a game, an incident, like, why has it triggered us to go to where we can't control our anger anymore? I'll give you an example. For me, I used to lose it over things getting spilled. I know, you're like, really? Yeah, I know. Like, I just, it would just make me either, like, I would do explosive and impulsive. I'd, I'd like, go... Or I go, okay, just, just, mm, 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 I kind of walk away and stuff like that. And, and I think I, I might have been a little too emotional in one of the instances because my daughter was like, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. And I was like, like, that's not good. So now I've made this thing where now my daughter's afraid to spill things because they don't like me when I'm angry. And I can't just say, well, don't spill stuff and I won't get angry. It's that simple. Don't spill something, I won't get angry. But it's got to be more than that. I have to identify why is it that I get angry when things spill. And so I, you know, I went through journey of wholeness a couple times. I asked a lot of questions. You went through a lot of things. And I realized that my, all this anger stemmed from fear. Because if something spilled, that means that it's probably broken or it needs to be fixed. And do I have the money to fix it? And if I put money into it, will it put me in debt? And if we're in debt, will we be homeless? And if we're homeless, will we be on a strike? Will people die of sickness and hunger? I mean, again, irrational fear. But I realized that my anger wasn't because of spill, it was because of fear. And that's why it's so important when it comes to angry, don't just say, I'm angry because I'm angry, but identify it. Why am I angry? What is the root of this anger? Because when we don't mask our anger, when we reveal our anger, we're not even allowing our anger to control us. So number one, reveal your anger. And number two, once we reveal our anger, we need to resolve our anger. The scripture said, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Here's a little fun story. A little old lady goes to the doctor and says, doctor, I have this problem with gas. But it really doesn't bother me too much. I mean, my farts, they never smell, and they're always silent. As a matter of fact, I've farted at least 20 times since I've been here, and you haven't said a thing about it. So I just, is it a problem? The doctor says, hmm, I see. Take these pills and come back to see me next week. The next week, the lady comes back and says, doctor, I don't know what you gave me, but now my farts, all those silent, stink. They smell terrible. And the doctor says, good, now that we've cleared up your sinuses, let's work on your hearing. <laughs> See, for some of us, we don't think we need to resolve our anger because no one notices it. But the truth is, people do. And it's usually the people who are closest to us, that and who, the people we care most about, who do notice it. And because our anger shouldn't be something we hold on to, but something that we resolve. So how do we resolve anger? I think we do it in a few ways. One, we need to confront the issue. Matthew 18 says, Jesus says this, If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. See, I think Jesus gives this formula on confronting people because he knew we would avoid it. And confronting the issue is never fun, but it's necessary to resolve the anger in us. And I know for some of us, we're just hoping the issue goes away if we just ignore it. And it, maybe it could, but we're allowing anger to fester when we ignore it instead of confront it. Here's another way that we can resolve anger is to correct the issue. 
Maybe it's an incident like I discussed earlier with spilling things where I need to take the proper steps to control my anger. Meaning when that thing comes up that makes you angry, some of us, we need to just correct the issue by one, to stop and not go the normal response. It's okay to pump the brakes on your anger, to come to a full stop and go, no. It's also okay that when your kid does something that you walk away from the incident and not correct out of anger. Your kids aren't animals. They're going to remember what they did. But you need to stop and say, I'm not going to allow my anger to come in to the discipline part of the correcting because it may go beyond what they need. So we need to stop before we go to our normal response. We need to identify the source of your anger. Why am I angry about this? For me, I'm angry because I'm in fear, but I have to remind myself I have nothing to fear. This is going to be fine. I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to go on YouTube and figure out how to get the red stuff out. I'm going to be okay. And then you need to create another option. I'm not going to go the anger, so I'm going to go here. So what is that other option? Maybe it's praying. Maybe it's going to your spouse and saying, I need you to handle this. Maybe it's just just forgetting it. You're like, what? Forget it? Yeah. Because you don't want your anger to win. So confronting and correcting the issue will help us resolve the anger in our lives so that we're no longer holding on to the anger. But, I know some of you guys look at me, but what if we can't resolve our anger? Like what if we have confronted and tried to correct the issue and the results haven't changed? Like I've done everything. Then I think we need to do number three, which is we need to release our anger. The scripture says, for the anger gives a foothold to the devil. I want to focus on that word foothold because there's many different like phrases used in verse 27. Like the ESV says it's an opportunity. Don't give the devil an opportunity. The New King James says don't give the devil a place. But the word foothold is used in the New Living Translation and the NIV. And I love it because the definition of foothold is a place where a person's foot can be lodged to support them securely. A secure position from which further progress may be made. So when we leave our anger unresolved and still in control, we're allowing the devil to place himself in our lives. And you know what makes more and more progress? Is when we say things like, I tried. I did all I could. I mean, that gives him more progress because he doesn't want your anger to go. He wants it to grow. He wants it to grow to a place where you're more and more bitter, where you're losing sleep and focus, where you think all of your relationships and all your friendships are going to be the same. He wants you to live in that uncontrolled anger. And I know some of you are like, but wait a minute. I did do everything I could. I did try everything. I mean, I I try to reconcile. I ask for forgiveness. The person's dead. I can't do anything anymore. So what do you want me to do? And those things are true. You're going to go to people and you're going to try to fix something. And you're going to try to do everything, even what Jesus says. And and, and maybe some of you are going to be like, yeah, I think we need to go to my church. They're like, well, I'm not going to your church. It's going to get to that point. Some of you, you're going to ask for forgiveness and they're going to go, I don't want to forgive you. And some people, you just didn't have the opportunity before they, were, they left this earth. So what do we do in those moments? When there's nothing we can do, we need to release them to the God who can do all things. Hebrews 10.30 says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So release that anger. Release that unforgiveness. Give it to God. And here's the great thing is when you give it to God, the devil, the devil will never have a foothold in his life. Because Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says, He who is God will strike your head and you the devil will strike his heel. You know what that's a good picture of? You don't got anything on me. You can try all you want. But I have control. I have power. And so we, as people who are being controlled by anger, we need to just give it to him. We need to just hand it over to him and remind and give him the person who will have vengeance. Oh, but I'm so mad at that person. Give it to God. Because nothing, he can't be controlled by anger. 
give it to him. For some of you, it might be something like this. Maybe you need to write a person's de- name down. Maybe you need to write an incident down. Maybe you need to write something down and say, God, I can't control this. There's nothing I can do about this. But I believe you can. I believe that you will handle this, and so I am giving this to you. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would set me free from this. In Jesus' name, amen. And then you need to tear it up, or you need to burn it, or you just do something to where it's gone. And it needs to stay gone in your life. And I know for some of you this is going to be hard. Because the offense is big and the hurt is deep. And in no way am I saying you need to ignore or pretend it didn't happen. I'm not saying that. You need to bring it to light. You need to reveal it. But if there's nothing you can do about it, then give it to God. Because God wants to transform you. He wants to set you free from it. So when you can't resolve it, you've got to release it to God. That's why we worship Lifting our hands is a sign of surrender, but it's also, God, do whatever you got to do in my life. I release it all to you. I want to end with a story about a boy. A boy who grew up in anger, like anger was all around him. He had a father who dealt with anger, a grandfather, uncle, cousins. I mean, it was, you could say that maybe anger is in his genes. But the boy didn't like what anger did around him. See, he saw his grandfather abuse his grandmother. He saw his father abuse his mother, his siblings. He saw it in the uncles. This anger that was in his genes was an abusive anger. But he he thought in his head, I have this anger, but I don't want to do that. So he made a decision. I'm not going to hit others. I'll just hit myself. And so he'd do things when he was angry, he'd just hit his chest. And one hit would do two hits. And sometimes it'd be a smack in the face, hit in the arm. And sometimes he was so angry, he'd hit himself over and over. He had bruises on his face and his chest. But he's not hurting anyone, right? No one's going to be upset with this until a loved one saw it. Freaked the loved one out. And he tried to tell him, hey, I'm not hitting anyone. I'm not hurting anyone. So he he made a compromise. Okay, I won't hit myself in the chest and the face anymore, but I'm going to hit my hand because i got to release this anger. It's in me. And so he started doing that. When he's angry, you do this. But the problem was, this hand started to look like a person to him. So if he was angry at the person, he would hit the person. Not really hitting the person. But then this thought came to his head. What if, what if I go over the edge? What if I have an opportunity to really hit that person I do it? Then he realized if he doesn't control this anger, he will be his grandfather, his father, uncles. Everything he said he would never be. So he decided to let go of the anger and let God have the anger. He revealed the anger. And God had to reveal to him that it's not in your genes. In fact, Psalm 34, 17 says, the Lord hears his people when we call him for help. He rescues them from all troubles. So he had to reveal the anger. He had to resolve the anger and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. He had to release the anger. God, this is yours. And I can tell you, this person's been six months free of self-mutilation. How do I know this? That person's me. And I know it's very hard because you go, wait, you're one of the pastors on staff. You shouldn't be doing that. I know. For a man who speaks the Bible and speaks the word, as sometimes I... I forget to remind myself that God can do all things in your life too. And that you don't have to hold on to this anger anymore. Here's a great thing about it. The day I stopped doing it, my wife saw it. And she goes, I'm really proud of you. I said, me too. And I was set free from that anger. And here's what I love too. I've had three people tell me, 
man, why are you doing the message on anger? Like, you're never angry. I'm like, man, that's one of the best things you could tell me. Because that's all I knew, was known as, as an angry person. I always heard this all the time. Bro, why are you so mad? Like, I heard that all the time. And so I'm so glad that God has transformed my life and got me to a place where people are like, you're talking about anger? Like, you should, t-. One, one of my friends said, you should talk like about joy. And I'm like, well, I, I, I hugged him. I was like, thank you so much. Because that means so much to me. For a person who is known as their anger is not known by that anymore. So don't, don't be controlled by your anger. One, don't, don't think you can't be angry. God wants us to be angry, but he doesn't want us to be controlled by anger. But if you feel like you're going to be controlled, one, reveal it. What, what is getting me angry? And once you reveal it and you get to the root of it, resolve it. And if you can't resolve it, release it. Can I pray with you? Salvation is literally letting go and letting God transform your life. It's believing that Jesus came, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, and defeated death so that we could be a new person. So with everyone's head bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you've never done that before, you've never welcomed Jesus into your life, we're going to do one of two things. One, if you're here and you're saying, I want to make him my Lord and Savior. Lord meaning I want to give him control. I want him to be the ruler of my life and Savior meaning I'm going to allow him to save me of my sins. We're going to do one of two things. I'm going to have you slip up your hands and just look at me, and then we're just going to say a prayer together as a church. So if that's you and you want to start your relationship with Jesus, you don't want to just be a person who understands Jesus or knows Jesus, but you want Jesus to be in your life. Can I just have you raise your hand and look at me real quick? Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Anyone else? Awesome. Church, let's say, can we say this prayer together? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Change me. Make me new. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision for the very first time, even if you didn't raise your hand, you're like, I didn't raise my hand. If you said that prayer, like, from the heart, you've made the decision to start your Jesus journey. And we understand that that's just step one. So we want to help you on this journey. So if you could do me a favor, you can just scan the QR code. It's in, it, it's in the seat in front of you, or if you're in the front row, it's below, or I'm pretty sure you can reach that QR code. We'd love to just get some information from you. We're not going to call you at the middle of the night. We're not going to, you know, none of that stuff. We just want to get some information and connect with you. And if you could check the box in, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. We want to help you on these next steps, like getting you a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible, totally free. But here's what I'd say, too. Go to the Welcome Center and get one of our devos. Because some of you guys, you're going to get the Bible, and you're like, I got a Bible. And you're going to be like, I don't know what to do with it. But that devo might be the way to go. Where you just get the date. It has the date. It gives you, like, a scripture, maybe two scriptures, and a fun story to go with it. It helped me a ton when I was first getting into the Bible. And I appreciate it so much. And it got me to go, okay, where is John? Okay, I'll find John. Where is Romans? Okay, I'll find Romans. It gets you in the word. We want you to start praying. What is prayer? Prayer is just talking to God. It's not memorizing scripts. It's, not, it's just talking to him like you would talk to your best friend. Where you just, you're real and honest. But it's got to be continual. It's got to be something that you do every day. And it should be more than just when you wake up, when you go to bed, and when you do meals. But when you need help. Like when you need help with your anger. Say, God, I need, I need you to reveal. I need to resolve. I need to release. Help me right now. And we want you to be a part of a church. And we say this all the time at Life Church. We are a church for anybody, but we know we're not a church for everybody. So if you're like, I didn't like the way you talked about anger and you're pretty emotional, I get that. But here's a great thing about it. We are surrounded by great churches. And we'd love to connect you with a church, but you can't use the excuse of, I didn't like Life Church, so I'm not going to church. No, you've got to go in church. And you've got to be con- connected with a body of believers who will help you from where you are to where God wants you to be. Can I have you bow your heads one more time? Now some of you uh, are in here and you're saying, no, I am a Jesus person. But man, anger, anger has control of me. Like it is in my life. And I've been struggling with it probably longer than you have. 
but I want to give it to God right now. I want to reveal it. I want to resolve it. I want to release it. And I need help with it. If that's you, can I have you just raise your hand real quick? So Lord, I thank you for all these hands. I thank you for all these honest people who are saying, man, I have anger, but I don't want it anymore. I don't want to hold on to it anymore, Jesus. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that one, you would give them wisdom. You give them direction. You give them insight, Lord, but you would not let them walk in excuses. Because, Lord, even if we can't resolve it, we can release it to you. So right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I, I push the devil out of people's lives so that they are not controlled by anger anymore. They are not controlled by what it does to themselves and their family. And I pray, Lord, that there would be new people, transformed people, that will come out of this. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you guys. Amen.